All right, uh, time to do a little housekeeping. Uh, for those of you who want to ask questions, and we know there's a lot of you, and by all means, we want to be able to answer all of your questions over these next three, four days. Uh, please remember that to ask questions, if you ask your questions, you'll go to the left side of your device, and you'll see a little icon there of, of uh, people at the top. It's the top one there. Click on that, and then on the right side of your screen, a box will open, and you'll see a chat box down at the bottom of that window. Um, please submit your questions, uh, any thoughts you may have, and uh, we'll answer those questions as soon as we can. If you have opinions, by all means, we'd love to hear your opinions as well. Uh, be aware, hey, that you get a chance to take part in the survey after each one of our sessions, and we hope you do that. So that way we can uh, learn from what we're doing and, and try to make sure that we uh, get all the information that you uh, want to learn about. Um, we also have on demand uh, available to you throughout the conference. So if there's a session that you've missed but would like to go back and take uh, and, and listen to, by all means, you have that opportunity. Our exhibit hall is open and we hope you'll, able, you'll be able to uh, uh, visit all of our exhibitors sometime during the conference and see what many of them have to offer. We think you're going to enjoy that. Um, also, as you, uh, if you haven't heard or, or learned from our first session earlier today, this tie is now up for bid. This is what we call, uh, we're calling the hope tie. Um, the gold in our, in our logo with the pics illustrates hope. And uh, we first introduced, introduced this two years ago in Las Vegas. And um, the idea at that time was given to us, hey, why don't you, why don't you auction off the, uh, your hope tie, and we would have done it last year in Denver. Unable, of course, we weren't weren't able to do that, um, but we're going to do it this year. So, if you'd like to put a bid in on the hope tie for this year, just send me uh, your bid at joel at ataxia.org. We'll keep track of that, and we will give updates throughout the conference. So, all right, um, our next session coming up is entitled "Unmasking Ataxia." And uh, we have two great speakers for you in regard to this session. We have Dr. Vikram Shakate and our very own Sue Hagen here at the National Taxi Foundation. Uh, Dr. Shakate's research and clinical interests are really in, in understanding the neuronal dysfunction in ataxia uh, in order to uh, treat symptoms and slow the you know slow degeneration in ataxia. Um, Dr. Shakate is a co-director of our Clinical Research Consortium for the Study of Cerebellar Ataxia here at NEF and uh, currently at uh, the University of Michigan. However, Dr. Shakte will be moving soon to the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas. Sue Hagen has been with the National Taxi Foundation for 14 years. Sue serves as our Research Services Director and has many responsibilities here at, uh, at NEF and Frankly, we don't have a lot of time to share all those responsibilities, but just a couple. Sue, Sue does sit on our uh, and oversee our research grant funding program, our brain donation program, and Sue directs our annual taxi investigators meetings. So, uh, with that, uh, Sue Hagen, it's all yours. Take it away. Thank you, Joel, for that kind introduction, and thank you for inviting me to provide an overview of NAF's research programs which have developed over the years to be very robust and include an impressive portfolio. I'm happy to be followed by Dr. Vikram Shakate, who will provide more details on our recently funded grants. In a nod to the AAC theme, we have titled this presentation, Research, the Key to Unmasking Ataxia. This is the disclaimer slide. I have no disclosures, although I am on staff full-time at the National Ataxia Foundation. This first slide lists our traditional grant programs, which include seed money, young investigator, postdoc, and pioneer grants, in addition to special research projects that we believe are necessary to bring research from bench to bedside. In other words, to bring meaningful treatments to the clinic. I want to mention that my colleague, Marianne Peterson, leads the brain donation program and works closely with the families at a very difficult time as they grieve the loss of a loved one but also want to have tissue donated for research. Thank you, Marianne. Here you will see the grants that were funded for the upcoming research term, which began March 1st. Kelsey Trace, our research services manager, administers this program from the first letter of intent that arrives through the, through the peer review process and the final funding decisions. 
and ultimately sending award letters to the grant recipients. We are grateful for the, to the many established ataxia researchers who volunteer their time to provide re reviews so that we are confident that NAF is funding only the best science. I won't read these numbers to you, but I will call out the Diverse Scientists in Ataxia Pre-Doctoral Research Fellowship Award that was newly created to increase diversity and inclusion within the ataxia researcher community. The deadline for the receipt of those applications is Monday, so I don't have any of the details for you yet. You will see then that NAF funded $740,000 in our traditional grant funding mechanism with the types of ataxia funded and countries represented listed on this slide. When you add the other projects that NAF funds, the dollar amount increases to just over a million dollars. So what is the impact of all this research? I've listed in no particular order some of the benefits that of NAF's funding program. Opportunities to partner with other organizations ensures that we are working together and not each reinventing the wheel. Dr. Shakate will share his story of how NAF funding helped him in his early career year, years. We know that to move the field to treatments for the ataxias, we will need discoveries in basic in discoveries in basic, translational, and clinical research to which NAF fund provides funding in all of these categories. And finally, in particular with seed money grants, these smaller grants provide researchers the ability to gather enough preliminary data to seek out funding from NIH, which provides a 10 to 20 fold increase in the ataxia research dollars. So as my dad always told me, you got to have a goal, Susan, what's your goal? We have a goal at NAF with our research program, and that is to bring treatments and even cures to these diseases on behalf of our ataxia community. You deserve nothing less than that. I want to thank all of you who donate to our annual research drive to make this possible. And in addition to Marianne and Kelsey, I thank the entire NAF staff. Each of you have your fingerprints on our research program in some aspect or another. And I'm grateful to work with you all. And now we'll hear from Dr. Shakate. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure today to be with you to talk about the research update. Um, I'm gonna be joined and you've heard already from uh, Sue Hagen, the research services director at the National Aid Taxi Foundation. My role is the chair of the Medical Research Advisory Board of the NAF. Um, and it's, um, it's a real pleasure to talk about the research projects that are gonna be funded this next cycle by the NAF. So I wanted to start out by um, thanking all of you, first of all, for being members and supporting the research that it's, um, is um, supported by the National Ataxia Foundation. It's your funding that makes this research possible. And I want, to start it, I want to start out with a personal story. So about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago now, um, I was funded through a Young Investigator SDA award from the National Ataxia Foundation. And this was really instrumental in my career in developing both a basic research program, um, studying ataxia mechanisms and therapeutics, but also the clinical program, as well as development of an ataxia clinic here um, at the University of Michigan. I am now going to translate some of what I've learned these past, um, this past decade um, in moving to the University of Texas, um, Southwestern Medical Center, where I, I am gonna start a, an ataxia a clinic, a dedicated clinic for patients with ataxia as a need. So I'm going to um, um, focus on several of the um, funded proposals. Um, unfortunately, we won't have time to talk about every single funded proposal, but as you've heard from Sue Hagen, the, the breadth of the ataxia research that the NAF supports spans the entire globe. And you'll see some of that in the research presentations of the research projects that were funded. I am going to highlight the importance of these specific programs 
as well as hopefully share the excitement that I feel that these proposals will actually um, improve information knowledge and potentially um, bring no novel therapeutics to individuals with ataxia. The first category of grant that I'm going to talk about are the seed money grants. Um, and the proposal that I'm going to talk to you about is from um, Dr. Juan Blitterswick from the Mayo Clinic, Jacksonville, Florida. Um, the title of this proposal was Long Read Sequencing to Decipher a Repeat Expansion Causative of SCA36. So all of you um, have heard about gene sequencing. Many of the causes of ataxia are um, genetic or inherited. And the traditional way to sequence a gene was using a technique known as polymerase chain reaction, which is shown over here. So a single gene um, is amplified and the code, which is, consists of the four letters, A, T, G, and C, is read off. And that constitutes the code for the protein that this gene makes. And oftentimes to look at the sequence of a single gene takes days. Um, and um, in the past, it would take even longer. So this is very slow in, um, if, if it's a technique used to identify individual genetic causes for ataxia that are unknown. A, a huge development in the last, um, last decade is whole exome and now whole genome sequencing, where DNA is um, made into small fragments, typically either 75 letters long um, or up to 200 letters long. And these letters are then read off using a high throughput sequencing machine um, with all the little bits read at the same time. And a supercomputer then puts the little pieces together based on the overlap between the pieces to generate the code of the entire sequence. This is unfortunately um, a great technique, but there is a limitation in that many of the ataxias are caused by what are called repeat expansion. So for example, the same set of letters repeat over and over and over again. And now you can imagine if I break up the DNA into really short fragments of 75 and and then look at the sequence, all I'll get is the repeat sequence. So I can't um, align those repeats and try and come up with what the, where, which gene that belonged to or even how long the sequence was. So in order to overcome this, there is a technique known as long read sequencing, which is a very novel technology. And this is illustrated in the three different mechanisms for this long read sequencing as shown here, Illumina, PacBio, and Nanopore sequencing. So with this technique, very long sequences of DNA of the order of thousands or hundreds of thousands of sequences can be read off at the same time. So if you have a long repeat sequence that can be included in the context of the gene in which it is, and you can read off the sequence in the context of the gene. And you can do this simultaneously with reading off the sequence of the rest of the genome or the exome. So I think the um, relevance of this particular application, although um, the funding has been sought for spina cerebellar ataxia type 36, which is a form of ataxia due to six letters that keep repeating for a very long stretch, this uh, potentially opens up the possibility that a single long read sequencing um, test uh, when commercialized can give you the answer for a wide variety of ataxias that include those that have repeats as well as those that don't, which is very exciting. The second category of um, award um, that I'm going to talk about is a pioneer, um, SCA3 specifically, Translational Research Award. And this was awarded to Dr. Todi at Wayne State University. Um, and the title of this proposal was targeting HSC 70 slash four to mitigate SCA3, which is spinocerebellar ataxia type three or MJD. So Dr. Todi's proposal uses a fly known as Drosophila to study, um, study this disorder. And you're all probably wondering, what is the relevance of flies? I mean, flies seem completely irrelevant to studying human disease. 
But the important thing is that many of the advances that we have in genetics were really based on model organisms and Drosophila is one such organism. And Drosop the Drosophila genome is 60% similar to that of humans. And 75% of the genes that are responsible for human diseases have a very similar gene in flies with a similar um, function. So studying Dr. Todi's own work in his laboratory, identified this um, gene known as HSC74, which is in Drosophila and has an equivalent in humans and other mammals, HSC, um, HSPA8, um, to increase the toxicity of the mutant protein in SCA3. And this proposal aims to leverage this to try and understand better how this can be targeted for potentially treatment of SCA3 in the future. The third category I'm going to talk about today is the Young Investigator Award category. And as Sue Hagen already mentioned, um, proposals um, are not limited uh, by geography. Um, Dr. Sonia Duarte at um, Coimbra in Portugal um, received the Young Investigator Award um, for a proposal titled MicroRNA Specific Small Molecule Modifiers as a New and Promising Therapeutic Approach for Machado Joseph or SCA3. Now, um, a little bit of background about microRNA. So these, um, I, I'm gonna walk you through several elements of the slide. MicroRNA, so you've all probably heard of DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid um, and RNA um, or ribonucleic acid, which is um, the, the, the code that um, produces various proteins. MicroRNA are very small bits of RNA that are present in all our cells and have a really important role to regulate whether regular RNA, the RNA that codes for proteins, is ultimately made into that protein or not. And since this is an um, endogenous or an, a molecule that is normally um, um, involved in regulation, um, potentially leveraging and exploiting the cell's own regulatory machinery may be beneficial in the treatment of um, disorders such as um, SCA3, where the abnormal protein accumulates in cells. So what this slide shows is that microRNAs are produced in the nucleus of the cell. They're transported out into the um, cytoplasm outside of the nucleus where proteins are made and the microRNAs can bind to mature um, RNAs or messenger RNAs and can target them for degradation de depending on the specific microRNA. So microRNAs come in several, many, many, many hundreds of different flavors and identifying the specific microRNA that can target um, the Machado Joseph protein or ataxin 3 protein is the goal of this proposal. The final category um, that I'm gonna talk about is a postdoctoral fellowship award. Um, and I wanna just also highlight the Young Investigator and the Postdoctoral Fellowship Award are for junior investigators or trainees to try and help them kickstart kick start their careers and retain their interest in, a, in ataxia. A postdoctoral fellowship um, is a, uh, is a um, grant that's um, given to a, a young investigator who um, who works under the mentorship of a more senior or more established investigator. And one of the ones that I'm gonna to highlight today is um, Dr. Huijie Feng um, from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, titled Mechanisms Off and Therapies for Progressive Ataxia Due to KCN C1 Potassium Channel Mutation. So um, this is uh, an area um, that's close to my heart. We've worked on ion channels and its relationship in ataxia um, for, the, um, for a while now. And um, what I'm highlighting here is a review that David Bouchard, uh, a, a, a postdoctoral, a graduate student and postdoctoral researcher in my lab um, wrote when he was here, um, looking at various different ion channels that can cause ataxia. And an ion channel is a protein that sits on the surface of the cell 
and let um, let different ions like sodium and potassium and calcium into or outside of the cell in order to ge generate electrical impulses that allow neurons to communicate with each other. Um, so um, you can see that a number of different spinocerebellar ataxias are either directly or indirectly responsible um, are caused by um, changes in these important proteins that regulate um, electrical excitability. And this is also summarized in the slide from um, Dr. Alana Watts group, um, looking at electrical properties in cerebellar neurons. On the left side, you can see a, a cerebellar Purkinje neuron, which is the most, one of the most important cells in the cerebellum that's important for motor control. And that is often lost or does not work correctly in the cerebellar ataxias. And you can see um, under that blue um, um, kind of tree, uh, which represents that cell, there are these electrical impulses. So those are um, a graphic representation of the impulses that these cells generate. And each of those vertical lines is essentially a little pulse of electricity. And that the regularity and the rate at which those happen is vital to how these cells communicate in order to regulate motor control for speech, for eye movements, for limb movements, and for, and for walking as well. And um, you, what is illustrated over here is changes in these ion channels due to genetic or other causes can change the way these electrical impulses are generated and propagated and that leads to dysfunction as shown in these mouse models over here, a normal mouse that's running on a rotating rod and is able to balance on it on the left side. And on the right side, the mouse is incoordinated and falls off, which is a measure of um, how their motor performance is. So the rele relevance of this particular application by Dr. Fang is um, looking at KCNC1, which is a potassium channel um, one of these channels that allows um, potassium ions to flow through it is the, um, and um, encodes a specific um, kind of potassium channel known as KV3.1 um, that was recently identified to cause an, uh, a cause of ataxia um, known as MEAK, um, which is um, myoclonic epilepsy and ataxia um, due to this potassium channel mutation. They've generated a novel model of disease and are looking at whether a compound that they've recently identified can activate this channel and improve the motor dysfunction. And the relevance of such a strategy is broader than this specific genetic form, because as I showed you before, um, there are a number of different causes, including some of the um, inherited um, so-called polyglutamine ataxias that are due to electrical dysfunction and this is a potential strategy to more broadly um, approach this from a therapeutic aspect. Um, I'm going to stop here, and um, and I'm um, going to um, really reiterate um, how grateful I am as um, um, as the um, member and the chair of the Medical Research Advisory Board for all your support, and hope that I've highlighted for you the relevance, the importance. Um, and the various different categories of um, studies that the NAF funds and how important that is for moving the science forward, but also supporting the careers of young scientists. Thank you very much.